Welcome. This segment is presented by Ana G. Mendes University. As you know, every month, uh, to, thanks to the membership and the sponsorship of Ana G. Mendes University, we present you uh, different seminars, different topics that are going to educate you, motivate you, and empower you in different industries uh, that somehow is going to help you to achieve your dream, your goal, but especially to help you expand grow and understand more about the industry that you are looking for. So welcome again. And like uh, in every opportunity, I have a special guest. But today is a special guest, not just because he's a special, but also because we're doing a different format. We're having an interview style this time. We're going to do questions and answer. And my guest is actually an old friend. I think I'm seeing him up there over 10 years, right? <laughs> so let me talk to you more about our guest. He's uh, Alexander Isdell. He's actually an uh, adjunct faculty for Ana Jimenez University. But let me tell you more about his background. Uh, uh, currently, Alexander is the executive director of the Southeast Climate and Energy Network, where he leads and manages a network of 78 organizations across 11 southeastern states. Alexander was recently associate campus director of Ana Jimenez University. Uh, in the South Florida campus, where he helped manage the entire campus operation, including academic and student affairs and community outreach. Previously, he was uh, part of the foundation, uh, he was a director of the foundation at the Democracia USA project of the National Council of La Raza, where he was charged with managing institutional donor portfolio while also supporting major individuals' donor fundraising. Alexander uh, has worked in Hispanic philanthropy, where he was responsible for leading program design, fundraising, and project management for capacity building, uh, educational and economic development projects and uh, different, in different regions in the US, also Latin America. Alexander also worked as a consultant in the Argentine Consulate General in Miami, supporting international trade organizations I mean, negotiation. Uh, he has roles in different industries as a consultant, and he managed and built multiple stakeholder networks, also raising millions for multiple initiatives and causes through donor cultivation and grant writing activities. So as you can see, Alex is very qualified in different industries. He has a lot of knowledge in education, but today we're gonna talk about also about his company. He's a college professor, and as you know, he was a former um, campus director for Energy Mendes University. So let's welcome my dear friend, Alex. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, my dear Rene. So, so happy to be here, huh? Yes, it has been a long time, right? I'm over 10 years. Over 10 <laughs> years. And uh, we haven't really aged, have we? We look yeah. pretty much the same. Definitely huh? the same. And no <laughs> surgery, no Botox here. <laughs> so I'm so happy to see you. And especially we welcome here at the studio of the GTC. Um, I'm, I'm happy the fact that you took the time to come here. I know you're very busy. Uh, let's start talking more about the, the university, the school first, oh. and then we can, you know, um, <coughs> start learning more about climate change, which is one of the topics that we're going to discuss today. So um, in Ana Mendes, you keep teaching there. You are uh, adjunct faculty now. So yeah. tell me more about the campus. Where is located this campus, Alex? Uh, the campus right now, the South Florida campus, is in Miami Lakes. Uh, it used to be in Miramar when we knew each other yes. what, over 10 years ago. Uh, you were a teacher there as well. Uh, it was in Miramar. Now it's in Miami Lakes, and it's been there for about, I want to say, six, seven years. Okay. Uh, but I have been teaching Ana Mendes since 2008. Um, I, actually, I was actually at Hispanics and Philanthropy. No, yeah, Hispanics and Hispanic Philanthropy. Hispanic Unity? No, Hispanics oh. and Philanthropy. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Which is a, a different program, and it's national, but I, you know, I had a job with them, and I started teaching at Ana Mendes. And in fact, when I, when I applied, we had a, they had 90 professors there. And they selected 11. Oh, wow. So I, I didn't think tough. I had a chance. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I love the university since I started teaching there. I love their format, the accelerated format. You have adult students, immigrants, you know, uh, people who are hardworking, who have families, jobs, and, and go at night and really want to be there. You know, so I've always, I see a purpose beyond just a job, if you will, you know, being a professor there. So I've always stuck with Ana, Ana Mendes. And then for three and a half years, I worked as the associate director, so the number two person in that campus. And actually, one of the main things that happened when I was the associate director is we launched a nursing program, and it multiplied uh, enrollment by by 100%, if wow. not more. Okay. And that was in Miramar, and then the campus. Then I left, 
um, started my own consulting business and and so on. But I've always continued to teach there. Yes, and as you meant, this is like a. a a community, a sisterhood, a brotherhood, like you yeah. don't get away. <laughs> you stay, we stay with <laughs> them and we keep, you know, somehow involved with Anna Jimen. This is a beautiful university, like yeah. you said. The fact that it's bilingual and they have programs in Spanish only, they have programs in English only, and then the bilingual system, which is, you know, you learn yeah. Spanish and English at the same time, yeah. which is a great, great method. So I'm happy, Alex, again, about um, the, the experience that you have with the school. But also I know that you're the importance in the sector that you are. Right now you are <coughs> the executive director of the Southeast Climate uh, and Energy Network. So tell us more about what is this about, what is the mission, the vision, and what is your position as executive director, what the roles are? Yeah, so let, let me continue the story then. So 2014, um, I decided to launch my own consulting firm. And <coughs> in doing so, a few years later, I got a contract for six months with a uh, a group called the U.S. Climate Action Network, U.S. CAN. This is a national network of organizations. So basically what it is is like a, a chamber of commerce, if you will, okay, but for environmental and climate change groups, mm. all right? So within the U.S. CAN, they had a south, southeastern network, the Southeast Climate and Energy Network, which was a project of it. And it was a smaller network within the larger network. And I came in at a time when it was in transition, this is 2016, and it was also in, in, a, in a critical election year and so on. So I ca came in to kind of take over this network in a, an inflection point, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we created a steering committee. We started to create working groups uh, around energy issues and around environmental justice, which I'll explain in a second. Um, <clears throat> and we started to grow our, our membership and our network, and we started to have really good conversations and meet, meet in person in different parts of the South. And it became very dynamic. And I was able to really get uh, some leaders within the region to work with me. And we started to build, rebuild this network, if you will. Oh, wow. And it became independent. So in 2019, 2018, 2019, we did a strategic plan. And then we decided to become our own independent network with our own 501c3 organization, you know, so led by a nonprofit, if you will. And I was the founding executive director starting in 2019. And Maria, we had one grant. So this is grant-funded work, basically. Mm -hmm. It's non-profit It's a non-profit, exactly, yeah. yeah. We had one grant that I didn't have enough to cover my salary, if you will, in that first year. And, you know, and, and I started basically fundraising. And I do have a background in fundraising, so I know how to, it's not easy, but I know how to do it. And we started to, to hire some interns, and we started to, you know, to, to do different things. And within a few years, we were able to get more grants and multi-year grants, and then I started to build a team. And now we have, we're a team of eight people, and we're about to hire two more full-time, and then we have contractors, we have other people, you know, so we have a, a very strong team now, small but strong, and we ha our network started with 26 organizations in 2019, we're over close to 80 now. Wow. Um, so we have a presence in many different parts. Okay, of so this is a, uh, yeah. a network, it's a basically a membership organization. Yeah. You have to be a member to be part of this network. Uh, but when we talk about climate, it's really very <coughs> big, you know, the word climate is big, and when you hear yeah. a different uh, point of views, and uh, when you hear the news like, oh, climate change, climate change all the time. So what that really means, the climate change? Is this truth? Is the, the climate changing? Yeah, climate is changing. Um, and climate has always changed. So let's, let's separate weather and climate, you know. Weather is one thing, which is short term, right? And weather patterns will shift. But climate change are longer term shifts. Mm -hmm. And what's happened since the Industrial Revolution, uh, I'm going to become a little bit of a professor here, but... Yeah, that's why we have this show today. <laughs> we want to learn more. <laughs> so in the late 1700s, going into the, the 19th century in England and then Germany and eventually the U.S. and everywhere else, uh, but by the late 1800s, we had the Industrial Revolution, right? And we had factories and we had you know, mass production of goods and so on. And powered by the energy for this is coal, right, basically, and then oil and natural gas, right? So we have learned, the science have learned, has learned that these are fossil fuels, right? These are things that we extract from the ground. And that's what we use to power our cars and, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, we have other energy sources like solar and wind as well, which are clean energy. But these are dirty energy sources, and they, they contribute to climate, the global warming. The planet is getting hotter. Right, so basically these are heat trapping gases, right, and they have an effect with the, the planet gets hotter. And the planet gets hotter, then everything has, it has a repercussion across everything, okay? Mm. 
But this is because of the the cycle, or is something that we are contributing no, like we, to the contamination? No, this is human. This is human caused. Mm -hmm. So th there's two factors. There's one that's nature, right, that we can't control, and then there's another that what we do. So the science, and this is 99.9% .9 of the scientific community, has a consensus that it's human caused climate change. So we're accelerating. <coughs> Case in point. The last 15 years we've broken uh, have been the hottest years in record, the last 15. So every year we're, we're breaking records. May was the hottest May in record, you know. Uh, April was the hottest April in record. I was in, I went, had a brief vacation in, in Antigua. Uh, the Antiguas are talking about how, how hot it is right now, but it's getting hotter earlier, right? So the, the, the seasons are, are shifting, right? And it is because we, we are addicted to, if you will, fossil fuels natural gas, uh, mm -hmm. oil, petroleum, right, and coal. And these, unfortunately, um, have a, a very adverse impact on the environment. So it's warming yeah. the planet. So, <coughs> for example, right now, all the, the changes that we're living, <coughs> uh, the, uh, right now you're hearing the news all the time, especially here in Florida, it's like a, we know that we're summer, but we're having like a waves, hot waves, like every day we're reaching 198. Yeah. It's because <coughs> of the climate change. It's because of climate change. Um, it was mid-May, okay? You know, I've been in Florida. I'm from Argentina originally, but I've lived in Florida for two-thirds of my life. I know Florida. This is my state, right? I know what July and August heat is. June is hot. September is hot. But July and August is an inferno. Well, we had July heat starting in mid-May, okay? And this is proven. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's getting hotter. And it's it has an adverse effect on everything. People are dying from heat. In in uh, New Delhi, India, they had 54.9 uh, Celsius, which is 120 degrees, in a city of 30 million people. So people are dying from the heat because you can't sustain that level of, of, of heat, especially wow. when you're older and you're more. Or the most affected are older people and and children as well. I have a question for <coughs> you. Um, what is the biggest threat in relation to climate change and the present time? Uh, it depends on the region, but I, I, I work in the southeast, and we're talking about Florida. I, w I would say extreme heat. Um, and, again, it, the multiplier effect and the compounding effects of, of extreme heat, right? So the ocean is hotter. So what does that mean? Well, the ocean is hotter, meaning that we're, we've always had hurricanes, and we have had major hurricanes that happened over 100 years ago, right? But the hurricanes that we get now are even stronger because the ocean uh, water is hotter. And then that's the one effect. The second effect is these things are very strong, but they also move slower. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the, the wind event, but it's the fact that it's more rain. So you have flooding. So I think flooding, extreme heat, sea level rise are the biggest threats. Um, I think Miami, we had, what, two weeks ago? Was it last? No, two weeks ago, we had a lot of rain in South Florida. Yeah, well, I, yeah, two weeks ago, even a week we ago. We had flooding. Yes, it yes. wasn't because of a hurricane. It was just a lot of rain, right? Well, well, with Miami especially, it was flooded. The more east you go, the more vulnerable they are to climate change. Okay, so let me see. I, I understand <coughs> now th the importance of the climate change, but what organizations are part of this network and what they do with this, um, the, the vision or the mission, what they do with the organization? So what is the goal of? No, oh, yeah, so th we have organizations like Sierra Club, uh, NR NRDC, which is a Natural Resources uh, Defense Council. These are so-called big green organizations. So these are major organizations that advocate for policies, right? Oh, Federally okay. and at the state level uh, nice. in Washington, D.C. and in different states. Mm -hmm. So we have those members. And then we have groups like the Southern Environmental Law Center, uh, which is an it's a big organization that looks at the legal avenues to combat industries and combat and change legislation to benefit communities, basically, you know, in fighting climate change. And then you have uh, more local, smaller advocacy groups, right? Uh, for example, there's a group here, there's a group of organizations uh, that's a member of our network called the Miami Climate Alliance. A uh, very strong group of different organizations that do everything from advocacy to education to all kinds of different initiatives. Uh, some of them, you know, some of our members, like uh, there's a group uh, in Tallahassee, uh, Rethink Energy Florida, that they, they advocate and talk to, to lawmakers mm -hmm. to have policies that can, can help with issues that, that affect climate change. Like uh, what, what policies can help? Uh, for example, eliminating single-use plastics. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Uh, waste management is a, is a big issue, right? Um, these landfills that we have, they're not good for the environment. These landfills where we put all our garbage, yeah. they emit um, <coughs> methane. And so you have carbon dioxide, which is has longer term effects in, in the atmosphere, but methane is like, stays up there shorter, but it's much more intense, oh, okay? Wow. That comes from natural gas, you know, methane. Yeah. So, you know, how do we mitigate having less landfills, right? How do we do yeah, more where compost? Where we put the garbage though? I was, I was mm -hmm. in a, well, I was in a wet, well, we f consume less, one. Uh, consume less plastics, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, a funny story, I go to the store and I, I never take any plastic bags. I take my own bags, you know, and if I forgot my bags, I just put everything in the car and I go to my car. Um, but <coughs> but basically... All supermarkets now are doing that. They are not giving you plastic bags anymore. No. Aldi doesn't give Aldi, you anything. I was going to tell you about Aldi. They, you know, you need to find a box where you can right. put uh, all the stuff or you have to pay extra if you want to have a bag. That's right. I, I was in Dallas, yeah. Texas eight years ago. I, I did a project over there in 2015. Mm -hmm. Okay, and even then they had you had to pay in Dallas, and just by paying, people would take their own bags. They wouldn't. Yeah, do it. they don't wanna. They don't wanna pay. <coughs> so you so know, it's like a maybe fifty cents, but you say, why am I gonna pay fifty cents when I have a lot of bags in my right. house? Right. So that that's so that's legislation, right? Mm -hmm. That it's that's very very important. And then so composting. I, I did a. I was in a webinar with a group here in Weston, uh, and they have a they have an organization that they encourage people to compost, and they partner up with another group who goes to different neighborhoods and picks up compost. So compost is all the organic matter that we usually throw in the garbage, like banana peels or coffee grinds and yeah. so on. I have a composting uh, machine in, in the back of my house. Oh, wow. And over what, I've had it for five years, you have no idea the amount of waste that we put in there, right, that didn't go to a landfill. You understand? And then those nutrients that that mm -hmm. compost is very good for your soil, it's very good for your plants and so on. So those are machines <coughs> that you buy and you can... I, I built my home. own. But yeah, you can buy a composting oh. machine. Well, that's Absolutely. interesting. Yeah, I, I, said, I heard about that, right? Yeah, I did. That's so interesting, but we need to educate. I, need to I educate. believe that what you're saying is <coughs> not just important, but it's a, a need in the community to learn more about how we can prevent more damage in the, in the ecosystem, I will say, because this is a global thing. It's not just a local thing. It's a global Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And when you talk about <coughs> uh, Florida, you don't even mention other countries. Imagine in Latin America with other regions. Yeah. Uh, they are, you know, in conditions more than than here, right? It's worse than yeah. here, and you need to educate the community, absolutely. But the question is, what we're going to do, for example, with the plastic, where we can take all this plastic? Oh, you <coughs> say not use too much plastic, but the companies are all the time producing in plastic. So yeah. when you want to buy, it's plastic. Well, so we, the we regulation, it comes to the companies to tell them start producing in a different uh, fabric or material. That's right. Mm. That's right. We need to adapt. They uh, need to adapt. Need, so you mentioned several things in it, which you just said that, that are very important. One is it, it is a global issue, right? And it is one planet. <coughs> and planet Earth, I mean, if you look at the galaxy and the universe and what we know, right, it's a very special place. It's a very unusual and uncommon planet, right? Mm -hmm. So we can't take it for granted. You know? Absolutely. So yeah. I, know, I know some folks want to colonize Mars or want to colonize... Why don't we, that's fine, but why don't we take care of our planet? You know, it's a global issue. So within that, there's, there's something called the UNFCCC, the Un United Nations Framework for the Convention on Climate Change. And through that, there's, there's different in institutions and structures where countries negotiate around climate change. Uh, in 2015, they had the Paris Agreement, which, and this is very important for people to know as we educate folks, is in the Paris Agreement, it was agreed that we would f do everything possible to keep heat global warming under 2% Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. Now you think 2, two degrees, 1.5, 2 degrees Celsius is not a lot. It has, if, if we increase the average temperature in the world, in the planet, by 2% Celsius, they have thousands of species are going to die. It has a, a huge impact. If you go to 3%, it's a dire future. You understand? So how do you re decrease that? And you lose less fossil fuels. You consume less. You switch to renewable energies, right, like wind and solar, right? And we're in the process of doing all of that. These things are happening. It's not all bad news, right? But it takes, it's very difficult because, like you said, different industries who live off of this, families who depend on building plastic bottles or what have mm -hmm. you, right? You know, the transition to something else, right? Yeah, it takes years because it just to years. transition the recycle process, like uh, teaching uh, children at school, like no... 
uh, laundering, the, then recycling thing, putting the plastic in one right. place, the paper in another. So it took time, it years. Yeah. So imagine educating people with a new, cons uh, I would <coughs> say, um, concept, right, of how we can take care of the planet. It's going to take more time, but I think we have to start from some place, right? The What's beginning. Really happening? It's going to happen. It's happening already, yeah, like yeah. you said. There is a, a, a few days ago, ago, I had actually a discussion about uh, the um, the use of, um, uh, so what is this? The cream that you use to protect your skin from the sun? Sunscreen. Sunscreen. Yeah. I forgot the words. The sunscreen. Yeah. And there was an argument about that. Why the sun is affecting now more than before? Why now we are receiving more cases of uh, skin cancer? And, you know, years ago, decades ago, you were not really listening or hearing too much about this. I believe that is my conclusion, right? But you are the expert and you can help us and guide us on this. I believe that the climate change has something to do on this and the sun is getting actually stronger than before. So that's why we're receiving the the sun in a different way like we used to do decades ago. So that's why our skin is being more affected than yeah. before. Is that true? I believe so. I'm not an expert to that to that degree, but I believe so. And I think that the hotter, it's it's just it's more intense. Like I, I anecdotal story, but I was in Antigua and th we went on a um, on a snorkeling tour, right, for about six hours, and I didn't buy a hat. My wife bought a hat. She's from the Caribbean. She's smart. I didn't buy a hat, so we went out there and I got sunburned to the point, and I had stuff on me, sunscreen or what have you, but I got sunburned to for over a week after that. So yeah, I think the intensity of the sun. The intensity. But I did think about something when you were talking about that. Uh, remember the ozone layer? Yes. Um, there was a hole in the ozone layer. This is in the 90s, I want to say. Yeah, I, I hear, yeah, I remember. Yeah. And it was fluorocarbons, you know, the mm -hmm. hairsprays that were causing it. There was a global campaign about this. And it wasn't partisan. There was no politics involved. It was a global campaign. And basically, we successfully managed to close that hole. So we have proven that we can, if we get together, locally, nationally, globally, we can make this thing happen. We, we can solve these issues, you understand? I have another question here. Can you speak to the intersectional nature of climate change? <clears throat> this is very, very important. So there's a, and we're in, a, in an election year this year, right? So let me just put a plug that you know. Uh, inform yourselves, educate yourselves, okay? Make your own independent decisions when it comes to who you vote for. Vote at every level, not just at the presidential level. And try to get past the rhetoric and the politicking and really understand what the issues are. In my opinion, if I was running for office, okay, I would say climate change is the most important issue. And the reason is because it affects everything. Mm -hmm. All right, so for, for instance, um, it has a health impact. Right, the heat waves. You know, more people die. COVID uh, is also an, an offshoot of climate change. You know, other issues. You have health issues, and certain these issues affect certain people, certain communities more than others. So usually, poor people, more vulnerable people, older people. Right, uh, people with less are usually the the most ad adversely affected. And the people that usually don't cause the problem are the ones that are getting the the brunt of the mm -hmm. impacts. Mm -hmm. So it's in, in so intersectional with health. That's physical health. There's mental health issues. Uh, younger generations, my kids, I have a, a son that turns 21 and a 17-year-old. <clears throat> they're very stressed out about the issue. Mm -hmm. They're very stressed out because they're basically, in, they're like, we didn't cause this problem, and now we're inheriting it, and they're very worried about their future. So there's a mental health issue about it. Uh, there's a migration. It's intersects with migration. People are migrating because they have to. You know, the fires that have been happening in the West, in California, Oregon, those states, a lot of people are leaving California because because of this climate threat, right? Um, I've honestly I'm considering uh, we've thought about moving out of Florida because the summer has become unbearable, right? So people might start shifting more north or more south. So that has a migratory pattern, and when people migrate, a lot of people migrate at one point in time. There's a political repercussion, mm -hmm. and then you have you know more populist leaders come out and try to blame things on the immigrants, which is happening now, right? So. It has an intersectional effect across many different aspects because of the, the, this one particular issue. Interesting. Can you talk about one of the main impacts of climate change in the southeastern U.S.? Yeah, we already talked a, a little bit about it, but I think um, <coughs> heat, um, I think um, uh, the fact that we have uh, 
companies that are cutting down forests. So, you know, how do you counter? What's a, what's a natural strategy? They call it uh, uh, nature strategies uh, to to deal with climate change. Uh, trees. Trees absorb carbon dioxide and they mm -hmm. give us oxygen. Okay, that's so tr you're cutting down trees, you're actually exacerbating the problem. So that's a huge issue in the south. We have a lot of forests in the southeast and they're cutting down forests to create wood pellets that are then exported to Europe. Okay, so that's, that's an, another, another major issue. I think mm -hmm. hurricanes are a major issue. Tornadoes are a major issue, especially in the deep south around Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, those states. They're very much affected by tornadoes, so you have destruction. Um, so, but yeah. that's hard, right? Because it's a natural uh, situation that we cannot really do too much about it. No, um, we can just say we have to adapt. Try to be ready right. and adapt exactly. So within climate, you have uh, mitigation, right? Which is mitigating, basically resolving the issue, right? By transitioning to a different type of energy source, for example. Mm -hmm. Then you have adaptation. Sea level rise gets to a point where you're gonna, I don't know if it, there's a film that came out recently where it was in, based in Miami and everybody had to wear boots because it was already, the water was like this high up to your knees everywhere in the city, right? Yeah. So adapting in Miami, you know, you're putting up seawalls now too because the ocean is rising. That's a fact, right? Mm -hmm. Glaciers in, in Antarctica are melting. So these huge glaciers melt because, it's, again, the planet is hotter, right? Then the sea levels rise. That's a huge, and then there's something called loss and damage. Loss and damage basically is when it's the impact is so big that you just it's it's all gone. Small island states. Uh, I've I've spoken to representatives with them. You know, I, I was in a, in a panel at an event during Climate Week in New York a couple of years ago, and this gentleman from from uh, I think it was Saint Vincent. Uh, he said, you know, it's like for us, it's like we're worried that you know we're gonna lose our home, basically. So I'm gonna a major hurricane is gonna come, and then all of a sudden my home doesn't exist anymore. Wow. So think about the psychological impact of that, of right? That your home just isn't there. I'm from Jujuy, Argentina, right? So I, I don't get to go back to Jujuy anymore. You, you understand that it, it's terrifying. It is. It is uh, absolutely when you talk about cl So you are in favor of electric cars, for example, because that's a different type of uh, resource that now we are, the <coughs> government especially, is, is supporting a lot of electric cars or trying yeah, to... It's, yeah, a EVs. I, I'm I'm more in favor of actually public transportation. Than public transportation. And EVs, but EVs are yeah, it's better than a than a fuel, you know, gas powered car. But better but than a bicycle. When, when <laughs> bicycle. I buy. I ride my bike. I go to the gym right here next to your office. Huh? But <laughs> decarbonization coupled with you know, basically clean energy transition to a clean energy sources, which mm -hmm. is like again solar and wind. Can you talk about the value of networks? Because we started the conversation <coughs> about the network, the companies that are part of the organization, but what is the, the importance and the value of this network? So you asked me what, what the vision of the Southeast Climate Energy Network mm -hmm. is. So the vision, listen, listen to our very bold vision. We envision the Southeastern United States as a leading region for, for fair, just, and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. Okay, that's, that's what we envision. So. We are a network of, again, nearly 80 organizations in the Southeast, and the value of it is that we just had our annual meeting in, ten in Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, during that meeting, we basically brought, we had over 75 people there, all right, and we had all, all kinds of conversations about winning campaigns. Uh, for example, we had a group of, uh, they had a pipeline, a, the Bahalia pipeline uh, that they were trying to put there, which is very, not very good, and it was gonna be over in indigenous lands and so on. Uh, we had a bunch of groups fight that and win. You understand? So we had, you know, conversations about winning strategies. We we, we learn, we educate uh, different organizations on the work that they do, and we, we learn from each other. We talk. To, we don't agree on everything. We we have healthy disagreements about different strategies, different policies, and what have you, right? So, as a network, you become much stronger. As a network, you become much more more effective. You become more powerful um, in this fight. You talk about these network the organizations, and you mentioned the agreements and disagreements. Yeah. So once you have these meetings, you come up with solutions, uh, uh, proposals, alternatives. Uh, like a word, give me some examples in the strategies, winning strategies that you can come up with these uh, right. meetings <coughs> and the, the organizations that are part of the network. So let's say we want to, um, you know, uh, we're civil society, right? So let's understand who we are. There's uh, the government. Right there's the private sector business, there's academia, so the universities and all that, and civil society. 
civil society are your nonprofits, your non-governmental organizations, NGOs, right? That's who we are. So our, our job is to, inf we, don't, we don't pass policies, right? We have to influence, you understand? So how do we influence different things? So you, you, the strategies are, you resist is one thing, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that's where you have, you know, protests and so on. That's part of it. Uh, the other part is you reform, right? So you, you work with people who are legislating, if you will. You work with the private sector, you talk to businesses, right? And for example, talk to a group of companies, like a chamber of commerce, if you will, or a group of companies, and say, can you do this this way instead of doing it this way, right? Can you become you know, more environmentally friendly? You know, there's a market for that. People, your younger consumers especially, uh, they want to buy products right, from socially responsible companies. Yes, They're that's socially true. responsible that's investing, true. right? So I'm, all of it is important, but I'm more interested in that. I'm more interested in reaching out and talking to different people and not demonizing or not saying you're, you're the enemy, you know, no, working with different working organizations. Together. Yeah, and a lot of companies <coughs> now are implementing more, uh, I will say, social responsibility. We we'll talk about marketing and social responsibility now. A lot of companies <coughs> are thinking more on how they can uh, serve the community with different products or services without affecting uh, other groups in the society. And like you said, Millennium, Generation Z, they are more uh, conscious about this situation, about how they can, you know, buy from companies that are not necessarily damaging the, the ecosystem, yeah. right? And I have students that are, uh, when you talk to them, they, in usually in the projects that they wanna do, they wanna work with companies that are, you know, this type of uh, social responsibility that they wanna, they, they are supporting sustainability and sustainability. Mm. So which is the two things that are now very important. I think I have five minutes left, so I'm gonna go to my next question. What the greatest opportunities in the context that we're living in, you know, right now we can see? <coughs> oh, we, we are rife with opportunity right now. Uh, this is a, a very good moment um, to leverage. Uh, I think leverage is a good word. Technology, uh, lever the, we're connected, right? Now there's a lot of awful things happening. AI is both a threat and AI is an opportunity, right? It just depends on how you look at it and how we manage this, you understand? So I think, you know, there's opportunity for new technologies, there's opportunity for new business models. Uh, there's opp we need to get away from past frameworks and past framing and really think in a more f crisp way, in a more fresh way. And I think when we're talking, when you see a threat, when you have a problem, I, I see it as an opportunity uh, when we're transitioning to something else. And I think we're, we're in, a, in a very interesting period of time historically right now. It's I a very it. dangerous time, but it's a very interesting period in time, and I think you can be an active agent right now mm -hmm. uh, for being on the right side of history, if, if you will. You understand? And I think the, the key word uh, in this uh, conversation is adaptation. So you need to adapt. If you want to help, you need to open your mind and see how you can help in the environment, how you can help with the climate, how you can help in general, yeah. with little things, right? Like you said, it's not necessarily the company, what is the, the company that can do for the community in general, but it's also you as an individual, how you can contribute and help. And for that, you need to have an open mind and you need to be willing to adapt and change. Alex, thank you so much for this interview. It was a wonderful, um, meeting it was a wonderful time that I, I enjoy a lot of the conversation and the topic this is so important and i feel passionate about this because <laughs> it's a, a lot of things that we need to learn a lot of things that we should be teaching and educating people so i love what you're doing congratulations by the way and i hope to see you soon yeah no let me just say one last thing thank you my dear Renee, and I, I hope we can do this again um one shameless plug uh Ana Jimenez student uh, Margie Sadan, a former student of mine, is my executive assistant, and she's here as well. And, oh, um, yes. Thank you for coming. So it's kind of cool that, you know, we were able to hire yes. somebody. Ana Jimenez. <laughs> Time's up for Ana Jimenez, right? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Anna. Thank really, you. Thank really you, Alex. It. And thank you, everybody. I hope to see you soon, Alex. And for everybody that is watching this uh, interview today, I'm going to put on the credits Alex information. I call him Alex, but his name is Alexander <laughs> because he's my old friend. And uh, if you want to learn more about what he does, if he, you feel passion or somehow these interviews touch your heart and made you think about the future and the present, 
contact Alexander and see how you can also be part of this network. Thank you so much, everybody. Ana Jimenez again. Thank you. See you next month.